Hello and welcome to Trust Issues, the podcast where we're dissecting the first 100 days of Trust's premiership, examining how she's getting on and if she'll even make it to 100. As always, I'm joined by Ben Blissett, TLDR UK's lead writer. Hello. Hello. <laughs> very nervous today no i just i didn't know if you were doing the we've jumped up in the podcast charts so yeah. the we're nerd, already talking about that aren't we? we've got seven view- listeners now doing like a brag hey, let, we'll, we'll save the big brag for after i've okay, introduced sure. zach michaelis tldr's editor-in-chief hello how are you both doing good good we're the yeah. number 10 podcast <laughs> in the uk for politics. already already very on amazing. apple music on yes i mean there's so many caveats there it's it's not even impressive yeah. no. but it's slightly fun yeah, yeah it's definitely fun it's quite scary that people actually listen. Please don't listen. <laughs> no, it's way too early. You can't tell people not to listen in the first minute. Okay, well, let's give them something, something interesting then instead of Well, no, the, the interesting thing is that we're, we're number <laughs> okay. 10. Let's and, talk about politics. And, wait, yeah. and if we get higher, we'll, in the next podcast, we'll have a pint each for every place we move up the charts. That's potentially a 10-pint podcast. Yeah. And imagine the transition from the beginning to end of that. It'll take hours. <laughs> and like, also, by the end, Lord yeah. knows what we'll be talking about. It's like an Charles. automatic check on our success. Do you see what I mean? If we do too yes. well, we'll get too drunk and we'll go straight yeah. back down. All you're doing is guaranteeing us that we're, if we do jump six, seven places, we're not we staying won't. there on the back of the next podcast. Who knows? It might be the best one we've done. Maybe it'll just kind of turn into kind of drunken politics hour. Anyway, um, if you are watching on YouTube and you want to help us out, you can follow us on Apple Music, subscribe rate, review, all that stuff. Anyway, this is how we start a podcast. You're asking people to have a worse experience to not have the video element for our vanity. No, no, they need to do both. Oh, I if see. If they enjoy right, watching, okay. they should also listen. Right. Or just share with a friend. Anyway, um, this week saw the Conservative Party Conference. That's certainly the biggest news for trust watchers like us. Um, <laughs> the most watchers. notable um, moment uh, was obviously Truss's conference speech. Yes. Uh, this is one of the first major speeches Trust has done. Obviously, there's been a handful of others, but this is certainly one of the most notable. It's a really time to kind of set out her stall, explain what she wants to do, how it differs from previous endless Conservative Prime Ministers that we've been through in the last 12 years. Um, so broadly, top level, how would you both say she did at achieving that? Yeah, no, she did. To be fair, she did better than people sort of were expecting, which I think the media's had. A, it, it's, it's a difficult one because they've sort of been playing it off like she's done well. Mm-hmm. But what they actually mean is they did better than what the expectations were. And the expectations were low okay. based on the week, the week before's performance. Um, she had a sort of interruption quite early on, she which did. I actually, you know, there's been quite a few people talking about that. And I think... Largely, people seem to think that sort of helped her. Mm-hmm. It sort of gave her a bit more confidence post that. She seemed a bit more assertive. She sort of came out with a, a, a bit of a joke um, to start with about the fact that the you know the, she's going to talk about this anti-growth coalition a bit later or yeah. something along those lines. Um, so yeah, she she seemed a bit better after that. But yeah, it was a, it was an okay speech. It was quite short, about thirty-five minutes, I think. I think most sort of um, keynote speech like Keir Starmer's was you know an hour and a half two hours or something it was it? insane it was remember really last long. year's one too mm. yeah last year's one I think it's still going on <laughs> yeah. I think he's, he merged 2021 and 22's together but yeah relatively short yeah relatively short I think it was just that there was quite low expectations she slightly exceeded them um, and <laughs> sort of Tories are trying to play it off as if that's a sure. win when actually it was it was she didn't make any new policy announcements there wasn't anything massive in there it was uh, I think some sort of Tory MPs were saying that it's not going to be one that's going to be remembered mm-hmm. in the speech. So yeah, it wasn't it wasn't great. It was just better than people sort of expected. Expectations were minimal. Better than you expected too, Zach. Yeah, I think Ben's characterisation is basically correct. Like <clears throat> very low bar. She made it over that, but it was a very very low bar. Um, and I think once you sort of step back and, and s- just forget about the prior expectations, you forget mm-hmm. about that very low bar, and sort of measure that speech up against previous conference speeches, it looks pretty terrible. Um, I mean, I, again, Ben mentioned there was no policy announcement in there, no real policy detail. There wasn't really anything substantial in there. I don't think it was particularly well delivered. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we've talked about this before, but she's not a good media performer. I mean, she had, there were some very awkward moments there where she was clearly expecting a laugh, mm-hmm. didn't quite get the sort of crescendo on her, on her speech, and nothing came. Um, so I, I think it wasn't a very good speech. I think it, the only thing that's interesting is you can you can see the framing that she's going for um, mm-hmm. for the next couple of years, which is her against the anti-growth coalition. Yes. Um, personally, I don't think that's a great political tactic. I think it's like being the you know the pro puppy people, like who isn't pro puppies? You mm-hmm. see what I mean? And um, I don't think Labour are going to have too much trouble with it. Um, 
But you, you, it's at least interesting to see that that's the framing that she's going to be going for in the next so couple of years. She's targeting what she's calling the anti-growth coalition, which includes every other political party, yeah. people live, who live in North London townhouses, Extinction Rebellion, the Greenpeace ladies, who both seemed quite nice with their little sign. They were very prepared. They had a backup sign. Yeah. Um, anyone who po- does a podcast, any TV broadcasters, notably not newspaper journalists, but any TV journalists or broadcast journalists, which I mean, maybe includes us. Are we, are we part of the coalition? <laughs> um, are you self-identifying as part of the coalition? or? I think I'd like to, because I feel like that's just the majority. Like, right. I think this is what I'm building towards. I, I, that's not the extent of the list. Let's listen to the extent of the list. Let's put a clip in. Here's the list. I will not allow the anti-growth coalition to hold us back. Labour, the Lib Dems, the SNP, the militant unions, the vested interests dressed up as think tanks, the talking heads, the Brexit deniers, Extinction Rebellion, and some of the people we had in the hall earlier. The fact is, they prefer protesting to doing. They prefer talking on Twitter to taking tough decisions. They taxi from North London townhouses to the BBC studio to dismiss anyone challenging the status quo. From broadcast to podcast, they peddle the same old answers. It's always more taxes, more regulation and more meddling. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay, that's the list. (laughs) Um, It'd be funny if we didn't actually include the clip there. (laughs) Um, And so, so once you've included all those people, who's not in? I mean, conservative people who support her, and that's Mm. not even all conservatives, because there's a bunch of her own MPs that probably fall in one of those other camps and don't like what she's actually doing. So you're saying you don't think Labour will struggle against it. Do you think that's partly that it's set up to fail just because most people are on the other side and I want to identify as an anti-growther just because <laughs> I'm trying to appeal to a lot of people in this podcast because we need to get above number 10? No, I think, I think basically three things. There are three reasons that it doesn't look very likely to succeed. One, obviously, the, the obvious Labour response to this is, is just to say that actually they are pro-growth. I mean, I, I suppose that's, that's not it's a quite a brute response there's not really much detail there but my point really is that no one's anti-growth explicitly like apart from maybe the green party who, yeah. who probably would push some sort of degrowth policies to achieve certain environmental ends um so it's just gonna be very difficult for trust to pin that anti-growth label on yeah. labor successfully um the other reason i think it's very difficult is that it's a nice thing to say two years before a general election but for it to really have any purchase mm-hmm. in 2024, when we assume that general election is going to happen, she is going to have to imp- have improved the UK's trend growth rate. Yeah, exactly. And I just don't. I th- Although she could end up in the anti-growth coalition yeah. by accident. But she. Uh, let me do my third. <laughs> Sorry, go, go on. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, and I don't. I think as things stand, that's unlikely. And part of the reason that's unlikely is my third reason is that many Tories, mm-hmm. at least superficially, fall into the anti-growth coalition. <laughs> when when Suella Braverman talks about not wanting immigration or wanting immigration down to the tens of thousands. She is, even by Liv Truss's own lights, in the anti-growth coalition because Truss wants to increase immigration to bring up growth. Yeah. You know, when uh, Jonathan Gullis comes out celebrating against that solar farm, mm-hmm. he's also anti-growth because that's a classic way of investment, infrastructure investment, yeah. energy infrastructure investment. It's a classic way of boosting growth. And then, you know, on top of that, basically every conservative in a leafy shire seat, every southern Tory... Mm-hmm who is against house building, and that's basically all of them, because yeah. it's something that's done very poorly with their constituents, and they're especially conscious of that since Cheshire and Amersham, which is the seat, mm-hmm. the by-election, the Lib Dems won, um, campaigning on a sort of anti-house building program. Um, every single one of those Tories is anti-growth, because yeah. house building, again, is a classic way of boosting growth, especially given the, the structure of the UK's housing market. So I, I think that, those are the th- that, that last reason is essentially that a lot of Tories are at least implicitly anti-growth and how trust is going to get around that is, mm-hmm. it's not clear 
I just want to expand on your second point slightly as well, which is that it, it seems to be, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but in 2015, they tried to brand Labour as sort of, there could be a coalition of chaos under yeah. Labour. And sort of a few years later, when you saw, you know, that Brexit wasn't going through very well, economy mm -hmm. not doing very well, etc. It's quite easy to then turn that back around on the Tories. Obviously, it wasn't really that near to an election, so it couldn't be used, you know, for electoral benefit. Yeah. But this is a situation where, as Zach says, you know, by 24, if there isn't, very much growth it could quite easily be used against the Tories mm -hmm. to say no they're the anti-growth co yeah. you know coalition so I think that the, unless they're absolutely certain that growth is going to go up and I know that Liz Truss seems quite confident that this plan's going to create growth but if it doesn't it's quite an easy point for Labour to try and spin back around I on suppose them. that if there is no growth by that point she's got myriad other issues well, yeah, beyond a slick Keir Starmer line about you're the anti-growth coalition <laughs> of course I think if she's crashed the pound to achieve nothing I think it's just it's just she has to be absolutely confident this is going to increase growth yes. to be able to use that line or else it's very easy to turn it back around on her yeah um so that's uh yeah we'll have to see whether it actually works or not your notes ben comment yeah. that number 10 refused to rule out whether jamie yeah. oliver was part of the anti-growth coalition there was, they asked number 10 whether jamie oliver was part of the anti-growth coalition why and, um I don't know. I think it was just that they referenced just sort of more TV hard person. hitting journalism. Yeah, <laughs> but they, 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 they sort of couldn't rule out, uh, they, they, you know, when they were saying who's part of the anti growth coalition, yeah. so some, like TV personalities. So some Jamie journalists decided to, mm. to, to, to ask number 10 whether um, Jamie Oliver was part of the anti growth coalition and they refused to rule it out whether he was or that wasn't. That's great. Which is remarkable. And again, I, just the fact that this is, this is what number 10 is spending its time doing. Well, if, um, if Jamie is watching and wants a platform to voice his opinions on growth, We'll happily have him on next episode, along with a lot of pints, hopefully. <laughs> um, speaking about other people that are kind of being roped into this, it wasn't just Truss's uh, moment to shine at conference. A bunch of other people had kind of notable moments. One mm. of the ones we've got noted down here is Suella Braverman and her dream of the Rwanda flight. Um, what happened there and kind of what's the reaction to that being well i just think this is this is this is kind of wild she's in sort of a um she's in com conversation with um uh, a telegraph journalist mm -hmm. uh, I, I forget uh, who, who it was but she's sort of in conversation with that on like a platform at the toy party mm -hmm. conference and she's saying that it, it's it's something like it's my dream it's my obsession to see on the front page of the telegraph yeah that um the rwanda flight's taken off and i hope that's going to happen by christmas so the implication being that she wants this as sort of like a christmas, a christmas present sort of thing um she also, and just the fact that she describes it as it's, it's my dream to yeah. deport immigrants and I suppose it's just the language used around this. Again, it's just so cold. I mean, Pretty Patel, it's like a continuation of the Pretty Patel Home Office, mm -hmm. which is that they're, they're trying to be quite brutal with, with the immigration point. Now, I completely understand that there are going to be sections of the population sort of agree that we need to get, you know, lower immigration. But it's, and, and if that's the policy, then okay, that, you know, that's what the government yeah. wants to do. But there's sort of language around it. This is sort of, you know, a lot of people coming across the channel are going to be, you know, very poor you know very much wanting a, a safe place of mm -hmm. asylum i know the government wants to try and frame as illegal immigration but seeking asylum isn't illegal there's yeah. no no legal uh, case in the uk that you have to settle in the first point of contact um, in, in europe so this this idea that they're all why didn't they stop in france there's no legal requirement for them to mm -hmm. do so it's just this sort of cruel language around rwanda and about immigration that is a continuation of the pretty patel um uh, uh, reign in, in in the home office and it kind of demonstrates just how right wing that they're being on this how, how almost cruel they're being about it I, I as i say i understand that it's their policy but it's just the language is is it, you know it's quite brutal about it um, and then we also had Jonathan Gullis as well, who said it, his biggest fear was private schools losing their tax breaks, which is um, just another remarkable, another remarkable point. Yeah. <clears throat> Fears and dreams. <laughs> I mean, obviously, they're, they're quite conspicuous quotes in their yeah. own right. But I think what the, both of these are really a symptom of is a wider problem, which is that there is just no discipline in the Conservative Party at the moment and ministers are just winging it and they're yeah. just saying whatever they feel like saying whether or not it's consistent with government policy or not. I mean, the other thing that Suella Braverman said in that speech is after Truss had U-turned on the 45p tax cut, Suella Braverman said that she didn't think it was right, that her colleagues had bullied Truss into it. I mean, that, that particular, um, well, Suella Braverman's performance at conference was just like wild. Like mm -hmm. she was just spitting off everything left, right and centre. Um, and I do think that this is it's a symptom of that wider problem that already... Uh, party unity has broken down and it's also just really bad news for trust because mm. if you're two weeks in re I mean really two weeks in she had the queen so you know that wasn't really her yeah you know, you essentially what if she's only two weeks into her job and already party unity has broken down you, you've got to ask how long she can last yeah yeah so that's conference I think broadly 
less optimistic and successful than the Labour Party conference the week before. I had to wait and see polling coming out, obviously, to see what the public's reaction's been. I'm not sure there was necessarily a big unifying moment that maybe they were hoping for. I think probably the most newsworthy things were the dream of Rwanda flights and the Greenpeace protesters, neither of which are particularly good for the Tories. I mean, maybe, as you say, some segments, but neither of them are big, mind-blowing, unifying moments. Um, So that's conference. Let's look outside of Birmingham and kind of issues across the country for trust. Um, What what kind of problems is she facing? We're obviously he- heading into a difficult winter, um, but what are the big notable issues that Trust has right now? So one of the big things this week um, was that the national grid has said that there could be sort of three-hour power cuts this winter if Putin does shut off um, gas supplies from Russia to the UK um, and if the UK face a cold winter. Yeah. I think it's probably good, before we get into this conversation, <coughs> just to start off by saying that this is sort of a worst-case scenario yeah. um, uh, given by uh, the national grid. Uh, th- th- they don't think that it's likely. They've said they don't think that this is likely. Okay. So I just, you know, I, I don't want us to sort of get down the route of, um, you know, fear mongering for no reason. Um, it, it, you know, it is a possibility, but it is likely that it, it, it won't happen. Um, so Trust is sort of trying to come up with policies, trying to figure out how she sort of navigates this. Um, there are some suggestions that there's going to be maybe uh, consumers will be told a day before that they, they're going to have the, these three hour blackouts before, maybe yeah. be paid to use energy on non-peak times to try and reduce consumption. So there are a few different things going around, but this yeah. is sort of quite a difficult thing for trust. Um, it's quite, you know, we've known that this would be the case for a little while, that this winter is going to be quite hard, but it's just trying to come up with policies that manage that. Because the British public do not like hearing that, that they might have power, because even if it is a, an unlikely possibility. Yeah. Um, so far, there doesn't seem to be too much coming out from government. There was some suggestions that there might be a media campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, Jacob Rees-Mogg, the energy um, secretary at the minute, has said that he might launch, I think, about £15 million campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, Listras apparently shut that down basically immediately this was today she yeah. shut that down um saying that it, it was uh, not part of like her ideology or something like that saying that it, it was basically interventionist yeah which she didn't like uh, and just to be clear this would just be a campaign telling people maybe you might not have yeah. some tips on how to not use that much uh, energy over over christmas so on that before we get onto the policy and the potential media campaign mm. zach what's your read on how kind of likely these things are obviously this is apparently reliant on Putin's actions and whether he shuts off gas and you've obviously produced a lot of content for the EU channel on kind of Putin's recent actions so do you have any kind of thoughts on how likely you think Putin is to do this and therefore the knock-on effects for the UK obviously first thing to say is I'm not an expert in this sort of thing yeah um but I do think it's more likely than politicians are making it out to be and this is something that actually most of the experts uh, have been warning about for a while now is that there are a couple of things that could trigger essentially energy shortages yeah. in, in, in Europe and specifically the UK. Obviously, a cold winter is one of them. Mm-hmm. Further damage to interconnect cables, which is what we saw the other week when someone sabotaged Nord Stream. Yeah. Could have been the US, could have been Russia. Um, uh, my money's on Russia, but you know, people yeah. do, serious people do think it might have been the US. Um, and then the, the third and final one is possibly if we see further cuts to global oil production, which mm-hmm. was what OPEC decided on a couple of days ago. Uh, obviously, if you see cuts to global oil production, while most of our heating relies on gas, you get substitutions. Uh, yeah. And essentially, if you see higher oil prices, that does put upwards pressure on higher gas prices yeah. because energy is energy. Um, any combination of these could cause energy shortages. Uh, I, I, I still think that, well, the, the mitigating factor here is that European gas storage levels are far higher than they used to be. Mm -hmm. But the UK doesn't really have any gas storage capacity because the government shut down our largest gas storage facility uh, back in 2015 or something like that to save save money. Um, I also think there's a really interesting little fact about this. The the UK sounds optimistic about the prospect, I mean, Trust does, optimistic about the prospect of us keeping the lights on the whole way through winter. Mm -hmm. But a fascinating little fact is in our contingency plans, we assumed that we could import energy from France, worst comes to worst. We have an interconnect cable that connects our two grids, and we assume that if things get really tough, we can import (coughs) that energy. Interestingly, France made their own contingency plans and said we're okay. And in those ones, they assume that they can import energy from us. <laughs> okay. So we're in this sort of like slightly dangerous situation where because there's not sufficient degree of interconnectedness mm-hmm. uh, amongst the various European energy bureaucracies, yeah. they're all assuming that they can borrow energy from one another. But if push comes to shove, we're all going to be begging each other and no one's going to have any energy. Yeah. Um, 
so so I think there was a, there was a non-trivial chance of us seeing blackouts. I also think that actually, while this is this is sort of scary, you know, the, the develop developing economies engage in this sort of behavior the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, it's called load shedding in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh. And obviously that doesn't mean that it's sort of okay, but it's it's not necessarily the end of the world, uh, three hour rolling blackouts. And that's one of the many reasons why I think Truss's wariness um, to do this media campaign, the fact that she doesn't want to mm -hmm. educate the public on, on how they might conserve energy is just, uh, is misplaced. Yeah. Um, because, well, but, well, I can't go remember. On, what go on, go in, what are you saying? Sorry, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go on a rant on about this. Um, it's it's just amazing how scared politicians are of telling the public they might have to use less energy. Mm -hmm. um, like the fact that Truss is worried about telling people to you know change the way their boiler settings work or take shorter showers or yeah. you know use public transport is just crazy. These are not necessarily unpopular measures, um, and the the research shows the data shows that actually you can get phenomenal returns on investment. You know if you spend sort of like thirty million quid on a information campaign telling the public how they can save energy yeah you can save hundreds of millions of pounds worth of energy people really do respond to this sort of information um and, and it's not just a financial imperative it's especially a financial imperative obviously because the government is covering all of our extra energy costs so yeah you know the government could save itself loads of money by engaging in one of these information campaigns but it's also a moral imperative because high energy costs in europe and and potentially rolling blackouts might be tough for us but they are catastrophic for the rest of the world mm -hmm. you know if we end up getting close to energy shortages, we'll start buying liquefied natural gas on international markets to make up the shortfall. And we will push liquefied natural gas prices sky high. Mm -hmm. and, and that obviously is bad news for our bank accounts and the government's, you know, the government treasury and whatever, but it's actually catastrophic news for somewhere like Pakistan mm -hmm. or somewhere like Sri Lanka, which relies on natural gas imports for almost all of its um, gas supply. And you, you're already seeing this, you know, international LNG prices in Asia are already way higher than they used to be because Europe is buying, um, well, LNG to replace the Russian gas that it's decided to cut off. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to give you a sense of how bad this has got, the other day, Pakistan released a tender, which is basically when they go out to the international market and say, can we have some gas? Yeah. Uh, a long-term contract until 2024. No one bid for it. Wow. Yeah. So there are, I mean, whole sovereign states are, are running out of long-term gas supplies. Yeah. So, you know, while it's obviously tough for us, it's it's a sort of humanitarian and moral catastrophe for somewhere like Pakistan, which is why I think it's it's just so imperative that we, we get ready to save energy. Yeah. Um, and why I think that a, an information campaign would be a good idea. Do you think that part of the reason that Trust is holding out on doing this um, information campaign is that because the grid seems to think that it's an unlikely scenario that we're going to have these three-hour rolling blackouts and she's sort of waiting to see if that likelihood increases then she'll press go on the information campaign. Do you think it's maybe that she's trying not to sort of spook consumers, you know, worry people unnecessarily if it is a remote, in her eyes, a remote possibility? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think that's obviously what, what she's going for. I think, but I think there's two other things to say here. The, the first is that the idea that it's spook consumers isn't necessarily accurate. There has actually been polling done on this. And the UK public, we're quite a sort of like, we, we quite like the idea of, you know, performing our national duty, mm -hmm. you know, turning off the telly a bit early, that sort of thing, you know, not having as much tea, I don't know, not using the kettle so much. We actually quite like that. And the polling does suggest, and there has been recent polling done on the specific issue, that people are quite amenable to yeah. an energy saving campaign. Um, the other thing I would say is I think, of course, she's wary of, of the public blowback mm -hmm. if you tell people to stop using energy because some sector of the population will be like, oh, no, it's my right to drive a car. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. my right to have eight cups of tea, whatever. Um, that does sound like Ben. <laughs> so the second point, um, I think. I think the wariness, not just with this, not just on Liz Truss's part, but on the part of politicians in Europe and America more widely, is is overstated. They are, they are just too scared of doing mm -hmm. this, and I think there are essentially two bogeymen in this debate. There are these two case studies mm -hmm. which have spooked politicians from ever asking their electorates to use less energy. The first is what happened to Jimmy Carter in the 70s and this this motivates most of the american anxiety on this front this is why joe biden for example is so terrified mm -hmm. of telling people you have to you know gas prices are going to go up this is part of the energy transition um and and basically what happened then is during the the oil crisis of the late 70s jimmy carter flirted with the idea of trying to tell the american public you should drive your cars less you know maybe cars aren't a, they're a luxury not a right that sort mm -hmm. of thing and that just went down very very badly um, and uh, probably cost him the, the election in 82. Um, but on, on the European side, 
there was the what happened in France with the gilets jaunes, mm -hmm. which is when Macron tried to raise gas prices, mm. well, diesel prices, yeah, um, in line with this sort of essentially this gradually increasing tax on diesel that was coming in every year mm -hmm. um, to try and provide an economic incentive for people to move away from gas towards renewable electricity sources. And it provoked this massive reaction, uh, the Gilets jaunes protest, which I presume our audience knows about, but it was basically when, I think it was a couple of million French people got on the streets and wore those bright yellow jackets yeah. um, in, in protest at Macron's plans. And the th the, basically that scared European politicians Mm -hmm. if, of this generation from ever asking their electorates yeah. uh, to, to, to use less energy. I'm sorry if this is a bit of a rant, but it's just, I think it's really quite interesting. Um, and um, the, both of those, I think, are, they play too big a role mm -hmm. in political psyches. Like the Jimmy Carter one, Americans shouldn't be scared of what happened to someone 40 years ago, yeah. back when climate politics wasn't really a thing. Yeah. Um, and also, I don't know, necessarily know if the American experience translates very easily onto the UK experience. Yeah. I think actually our population is, is far more amenable to using less gas and driving less than the Americans are. The Americans are more fixated on that sort of thing than we are. Okay, uh, sorry, and the last thing I'll say is, the, the, and this is a rant, I apologise, but the, the gilets jaunes thing, actually the polling on that suggests that it was more to do with inequality and, and Macron's mm -hmm. economic programme, which was exacerbating in a, economic inequality and um, sort of reducing the power of labour. Um, so that's not necessarily specifically to do about environmental policies and people using less energy. That's probably more about inequality, which goes to sh the implication there is actually you can get people to save energy as long as you don't put the burden on the poorest, which mm -hmm. is what we should be doing. Yeah. Just one thing to add to that as well with um, what you're saying about government sort of underestimating how much the how far the public willing to go. I mean, I know this is ever so slightly different, but just at the er, you know early pandemic, the mm -hmm. government was very sort of wary of implementing a lockdown in the UK because they were scared that not many people would follow it. And the data and the polling um, following that suggested that most people were following that quite rigorously yeah, and they followed exactly. it a lot more followed it a lot more than yeah. they sort of expected. <clears throat> and this builds into your point as well on um, people you know feeling the sense of I'll, I'll do what I need to for the country. I think yeah. politicians are and there's evidence of this recently are generally wary of asking the public to do something thing um because they think that oh well they'll look badly upon the government for asking me to do that but I, as you say the polling has suggested that the public do look beyond the government asking them to do that and look at the wider context of the yeah. situation and the gravity of that um and, and sort of do their bit accordingly of course yeah. you know in in the media with lockdowns there's a lot of uh, case of people breaking it but yes. they are you know ex ex it was proven with with data yeah. that there were exceptions to the rule people followed it a lot more than the the yes. polling done before they implemented lockdown had suggested. You can see why that could be in their mind too, though. The kind of idea of we've just told people to do all this through COVID. Do we want to do it again? Especially with the kind of more libertarian wing of the Conservative Party, which is one of the last holdouts of trust supporters. You can see why they would be upset and she might think, well, we can't afford to annoy them but, too. But there's a huge difference, which is that people have had almost a year of almost mental preparation yes. that this winter's going to be hard and that there could be measures in place to deal with it. Yeah. COVID happened quite quickly within a matter of weeks of Italy's looking quite rough yeah and then us going into lockdown people have had a, a year of mental preparation that this winter is going to be hard true no, that's really interesting I, that's really i think it's a really really good point that, that you're right people the governments and actually scientists overestimated how well, well underestimated sort of people's resilience yeah when it came to lockdown uh, and thought we'd sort of all fatigue very quickly but we were all pretty happy to lock down for two years or whatever it was i like uh, the idea of some blackouts <laughs> Get some candles out, play some board games. I don't know. There's something cute. About I know there's it. there's a bit of levity about it, but I do also, you know, th this does also have a knock-on effect with a, with a lot of different things. Yeah. With, with with schools, business, things like that. There is a lot that you know. Th this will have a big effect on on people and business. But I, d I do agree that for individuals, for individuals, for, for it's you charming. Know, it's not it's not too bad. But <laughs> this is my campaign. All I'm saying is that it will be hard for some people, of and course. that should be. Oh that yeah, be and there's some people that will like. Yeah, rely on power for all kinds of support mechanisms in their homes or whatever. But but that's sort of my point with the with, with the gilets jaunes thing is that the, the really the, the fundamental thing here is that the the main thing is to make sure when you're doing energy saving that the burden doesn't fall on the the, mm -hmm. the exactly. worst off. And, and if you do that successfully, you'll be fine. Yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see if they take my advice. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll front the campaign. For I'm sorry, money. that was a rant. How though. much? 15 million, you said they're willing to spend. Yeah. How can we can pull that off? If we yeah. got 15 million, we could do some ads. <laughs> <laughs> Just not. Are you, are you making yourself available to the government now? I Is am. this your pitch? Hello at tldrnews.co.uk. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, finally then. So we've talked about her kind of issues within the UK. 
well, we started with our issues in Birmingham, then the UK. Let's go out one more level um, to the meeting in Europe earlier this week. Um, do you want to outline what happened there, Ben, and also kind of the implications for us? Okay, so yeah, so it was yesterday that there was a, a big meeting as uh, 40 European countries met in Prague. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, it's probably worth pointing out to start with that this wasn't just European Union countries. Yeah. There were some Baltic countries as well. The UK was invited. So it was uh, qu quite a big meeting. Zelensky joined, obviously joined remotely. Yeah. Um, and they sort of discussed issues facing uh, Europe at the minute. Part of that is obviously uh, Ukraine, sort of updates on that. Um, Tr Trust going there, you know, that's quite a big thing. It was one of her first um, international meetings, yeah. um, quite a big moment for her. And um, in a sort of event that could have been quite awkward, she um, had a meeting specifically with Macron afterwards. Um, and there was a, a bit of a statement from the government mm -hmm. after on, on what they discussed. It seems that Trust, from this, it seems that Trust is sort of softening in her uh, approach to international diplomacy. Yeah. I think sort of before she became prime minister, she was um, potentially a little bit hostile. Um, to, to world leaders, specifically on Macron, yeah. stating that she didn't know if he was a friend or a foe. Yeah. She, was asked, she was actually asked again about this yesterday by journalists who kind of pushed her, and she eventually admitted that he was a friend. Aww. But there does actually <laughs> seem to be a little bit of uh, yeah, cooperation. Nice, nice little day in Prague. Well, there you go. Uh, she met her, she, yeah. So this just went and met her friend. At, wow. uh, yeah, uh, there. But no, th th to be fair, there does seem to be quite a lot of cooperation between France and the UK at the minute. Yeah. Um, so some of the things that, that the government published in there, it was quite a short statement actually about what um, had been discussed between Truss and yeah. uh, Macron. So one of them was just that they would both support Ukraine um, yeah. until uh, Ukrainian sovereignty had been restored. So Makes I sense. mean, they kind of have to say that, but you know, yeah. we kind of already knew it. Good to hear. They also discussed um, Sizewell C, which is quite interesting, which is a nuclear power plant being developed in uh, Suffolk um, in the UK um, on Suffolk's coast. Mm -hmm. uh, it's already been, um, you know, in development. It's already been um, being created. And it's it's been funded, at least partly funded, by EDF, which has recently been nationalised, hasn't it? By yes, by France. Um, and they said that they're going to come to a, uh, a decision on the financial arrangements about it in the next month. So it seems okay. that they, they, they seem quite cosy on that. And they also discussed actually um, channel crossings as well, um, which <laughs> again, point of contention. Another the point two. of contention. But um, again, it seems like there's some. They, they said that they're going to tackle criminal uh, groups trafficking people across Europe, ending in dangerous journeys across the channel, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the exact wording. And then they said that the Home Secretary will uh, reveal some more details in due course. So okay. Again, really sort of weak. Uh, in terms of actual specific policy. Yeah. It was just a lot of lip service paid to a number of things. But the point is... They is weren't that friends at the beginning of the meeting, well, and the, now they're friends. Well, this is the point. Friendship is that, takes a lot of effort, then. Well, the, this is the point, is that Truss has sort of uh, been maybe quite hostile to Macron, yeah. hasn't really, uh, you know, engaging a couple of gaffes, maybe, yeah. internationally. Um, before she became prime minister, and maybe this is the, the sort of first step in her That's attempt of actually sure. getting cosy to some world leaders. Uh, and interestingly, it seems to be Macron that she's taken a mm. shine to. Um, France, obviously, being an incredibly important ally for the UK, kind of historically one of our major connections in Europe. Well, they're going to give us energy over Christmas. Well, apparently they? so. Yeah. There's a big old energy trade happening. Yeah. We're both sending some portable battery <laughs> chargers yeah. back and forth. <laughs> I've got a USB C <laughs> cable going back and forwards. Yeah, um, that is how it works. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, France is a particularly important one here, um, but more broadly too, as well as the specifics with the France uh, kind of relationship. Uh, what do you make of Truss's first? big hit on the international stage has she hit the ground or hit the ground running <laughs> well i mean i think as ben said like she's clearly been more friendly than people expected um i think some of that is because you have to be more hawkish on that sort of thing during mm -hmm. the campaign you know you're talking exclusively to conservative membership and they, yeah. they quite like the whole like oh we beat them in the war you know, that's actually sure. not a fair characterization of everyone in conservative membership but you know what i mean i know what you mean they, they like a little bit of friction with the frenchies and um <laughs> Friction with the Frenchies isn't going to help our friction with the Frenchies. Yeah. Um, but uh, I also think that this new European political community has been, it's been well done by Macron um, because it's a, he's made it really, really clear that it's not related to do with the EU, yeah. which has provided the political space for trust to get involved without taking any flack from the Brexiteers. Yeah. Um, obviously, a lot of the things they, they've tried to do to get the UK involved, the EU have tried to do to get the UK involved mm -hmm. in the past, have basically just been the EU plus the UK, yeah. which makes you know awkward yeah it's a yeah. bit awkward You're like a vegetarian at a steak restaurant and um <laughs> the <laughs> no it's not makes yeah, sense. i mean it makes sense I think I stole yeah. that. anyway um but the the other thing is that it, obviously macron made sure it was focused on ukraine yeah uh, and actually there was a little bit about armenia and azerbaijan because they were both there as well 
um, and that that conflict. So it's nice and sort of like war focused, which makes it easy for trust to go because you yeah. can say, you know, I'm doing this out of solidarity with Zelensky. Um, and finally, he made a good call by making it so that it oscillates in terms of the meetings. They oscillate between a UK and a U, an EU and a non-EU capital. Okay. So you know, it provides that sort of balance. That means that it doesn't, you know, trust isn't just going up to Brussels every couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a combination of things, isn't it? She's obviously softened since the campaign ended, and also yeah. it's Macron did provide <coughs> her with that political space. Very nice. Yeah. We'll have to wait and see how well it works longer term and whether she finds any more friends on the international stage. Well, she's might. still wearing the friendship bracelet on the next oh, meeting. Can you imagine? Yeah. I'm just imagining the Brexiteers being like, European political community friends. <laughs> 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 we well, cut that. It's a very no, outdated no, no. in between. <laughs> no, no, it's staying in. It's at the end of the podcast, so who cares? Um, okay, that's all we've got time for, I think. I think we've sure. zoomed all the way out from Birmingham to kind of the international stage. Truss has had a big week. I'm not sure how successful. I think varying levels of success at different levels. Um, but we'll have to wait and see what happens, especially as we head into winter, um, as we have to cooperate more with the likes of Macron and people in Europe, and also potentially have to reduce our own energy usage. Um, but let's get those batteries charging, everyone. <laughs> everyone get charging your devices. Um, that's not that's not advice. Don't do that. I feel like that's a bad idea. <laughs> We've got influence now. We're yeah, the tenth most true. listened to. And podcasts. you're expecting fifteen million pounds from the government, and your advice is charge your batteries. Well, last. if I give good advice now, what are they paying for? That's true. They need to partly you're be paying exactly to shut out my bad store, advice. Well, I don't know. Is that it? Yeah, I think that's <laughs> it.